Well, hello everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our topic for today is Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm sure a lot of you have been to Washington, D.C. There's a picture of me a number of years ago uh, standing in front of, I'm sure you'll recognize the building, the White House, right on Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where I'm standing, Pennsylvania Avenue. So our topic will begin first with cities, the role of cities in history, and how important they are. And then when the United States became an independent country, we had to build a new capital. Well, what was the message being communicated by this new capital named after George Washington? Gradually it taking shape, the emergence of a brand new avenue and how it became America's main street linking the Capitol building with the White House. And of course, like every great avenue or every great city, People love to make movies about it. Crime, political corruption, political wheeling and dealing. Well, you're going to have to have scenes from Washington, D.C.'s wonderful Pennsylvania Avenue. So let us get going. Well, many cities have created empires. When we think of the city of Rome, giving its name to its empire, which went from Scotland to Egypt and from modern day Iraq to Portugal and Morocco. Babylon gave its name to the Babylonian Empire. And the Aztecs, of course, they had Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan. And these were the capitals of great empires. Well, some great cities don't create great empires. Some cities uh, just become a capital of a small country, but with a different name. For example, you go to Paris, where well, you're in France. You go to Berlin, you're in Germany. But some cities like Rome and Babylon gave their names to an empire. So there were basically cities that created empires. Well, the United States was in a special situation because we were a country that created our capital city. So when New, when New York was abandoned and Philadelphia was abandoned and this brand new city called Washington, D.C., down on the Potomac was being built, the founders, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and everybody else involved in building a new capital city, looked back to other great empires. Tenochtitlan in Mexico. They looked back to ancient Rome. They looked back to Babylon. And they also looked to Beijing in China, thousands of years old as a capital city. They looked to Egypt, where I just got back from a couple of weeks ago. Many capital cities, the Arabs established Cairo, the Greeks established Alexandria, various uh, pharaohs built Luxor and Karnak, uh, and uh, uh, Manhattan built a brand new city of Amarna. So when the American founding fathers decided to build a city, they probably studied the history of other great cities, as well as the cities of their time. London, Paris, Rome, Moscow, Berlin, Vienna, the great city of Madrid. So capital cities are very important in history. Well, some cities not only found empires as Rome did, but they so marked human history that everybody wanted to cash in on Rome. Well, we had the ancient Rome in Italy of the Roman Empire. 
Well, when the Roman Empire fell, the Germans uh, decided to build a new empire, and they called it the Holy Roman Empire, centered in Germany. Well, when Constantin Constantin Constantine the Great uh, built his, what we call today, the Byzantine Empire, he built New Rome, which is today Istanbul, under Constantine, it became known as Constantinople, the second Rome. Well, along came the Tsars of Russia. And what's the name Tsar mean? It comes from Caesar of Rome. So he built his new capital city, St. Petersburg, and, and Russia believed that it was the third Roman Empire. Well, when Kaiser Wilhelm II united Germany, he gave himself the name Kaiser, which is another form of Caesar. So capital cities are very important in history. And Rome being probably the queen of all capital cities. Well, capital cities have their architecture. For example, you have the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, the Triumphal Arch. Donald Trump views himself as a Roman emperor with his toga. Even George Washington statue has him wearing a Roman toga. Below that, we see one of Saddam Hussein's triumphal arches, which he built to celebrate the greatness of his new Babylonian empire. Well, Washington, D.C. cashed in on the fame of Rome as well and it built its capital building in Roman and Greek architecture. So the model of Rome as a capital of an empire was very important for the early Americans. So the 13 colonies got united from New Hampshire down to Georgia, and they waged their war against England, and they won. Well, the problem was that the colonies were very different. Some were slaves, such as the colonies from Maryland down to Georgia. Others were free. Some were even in the process of abolishing slavery in the northern colonies. Some colonies were large, such as New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Others were small, little tiny Delaware, even Maryland, Connecticut and Rhode Island, uh, even New Hampshire, which looks pretty big on the map, had a tiny population. Some of the colonies had big cities, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Richmond. Others were mainly farming, such as Georgia, South Carolina, even the bulk of Pennsylvania was a farming area. Some were north, some were south. Some, the majority, were English background, but there were many Germans in Pennsylvania. There were other groups scattered around the Dutch in New York. You had your first synagogue in New York. Puritans dominated the northern colonies, while the rest were Anglican or Church of England. Some were rich, like Virginia and Boston, some were relatively poor, like New Hampshire and uh, um, some of the interior areas of Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia. Well, they all plan to grow. When we look at Pennsylvania, we see a straight line as its border on the left-hand side. That's because originally the states claimed everything between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Well, gradually they gave up all of these land claims and they added new states. But the diversity of the 13 colonies was a major issue. So when the 13 colonies finally won the war against Great Britain, they had to decide, well, we're going to have a capital. We're going to have a president. We're going to have a constitution. 
How are we going to be organized? Are we going to have a big, powerful army? Or is each colony going to have its army? Who was going to pay the debts? Thirteen colonies went deeply into debt to pay for the soldiers and the armaments for the American Revolutionary War. Well, the question also came up, well, are we going to have a capital in New York, which was the first capital? That's where George Washington was. Well, the southern states said, no, 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 no. We don't want a capital way up there in the north. We prefer to have it down here in the slave-holding south. After all, George Washington was from Virginia. He was a major slave owner. 300 slaves, I believe it was. And so they had to compromise. Where is going to be the new capital? How much power were the states going to have? How much power was the federal government going to have? These were all issues that the new country had to deal with. Well, actually, the first capital, even though it wasn't really a capital, um, moved around. It was in New York during the time presidency of George Washington, but it had moved around during the Civil War and even after the war uh, from Philadelphia, Baltimore for a while, Lancaster, Pennsylvania for a couple of days. Uh, and then Princeton, New Jersey, Annapolis, Trenton, and back to Philadelphia. Well, it was decided in 1787 that a new city needed to be built, that we couldn't have it in the north, we couldn't have it on the south. Maybe some point in between would be a logical conclusion. And so they decided they needed a new capital. Well, in 1790, the Congress passed a resolution, and it was called an act for establishing a temporary, 10 years in Philadelphia, and then a permanent seat of the United States government. So it would move from New York down to Philadelphia, and then while they were building a new city, it would remain in Philadelphia. Well, Pierre L'Enfant was hired by George Washington to design a new city. And here we see the map on it. Now, anybody who's been to New York, to Manhattan, can see the aspect of the grid, streets north and south and east and west. But they built a bunch of diagonal streets. And so you see these little white areas where it was a wonderful place for monuments and for trees and maybe big archways and uh, um, other areas which are very nice. New York didn't have these diagonals. And so when you walk around Manhattan, it's north-south uh, avenues and east-west and streets. But when you go to Paris, you see the influence of Paris on um, Pierre L'Enfant. It was a combination of the grid plan, north, south, east, and west, and lovely diagonals. This is what Pierre, who called himself Peter when he came to the United States, um, uh, designed. Uh, this was on the map on the right. That was his design for the city. And you can see the grid plan is there and diagonals are there. It was going to be a beautiful city with trees and with parks and monuments and statues and obelisks and all kinds of interesting things. Well, every city, every capital city has a message. It's more than just a bunch of buildings. New York, for example, with a grid plan. It's not beautiful, but it's efficient. You number the streets and the avenues. So you always know where you're at. You jump into a taxi and you yell Fifth Avenue and 95th Street and you are off. You don't have to have funny names for streets 
It is numbered. It's efficient. It's business. It's well organized. It's quick. Well, that's the message of New York City. Well, every other major city has its own message. When Peter the Great designed a brand new capital, which he called St. Petersburg, after himself and, of course, St. Peter, he had a message. When you look at the map on the left, you see Moscow, deep in the heart of Russia. Well, St. Petersburg is on the Baltic Sea. So from St. Petersburg, you could get in a boat and you could go to London or Germany or Sweden or even sail across the ocean to China or America. So his new capital was going to be a window on the West. It was going to be in imitation of Paris or London. And as you can see, the picture of one of the big cathedrals in St. Petersburg, there's nothing Russian about it. It is a Greek temple entrance with a Roman dome on top. That's the type of cathedral that could be in Rome or Spain or London or even New York. So the message of St. Petersburg was we're no longer a bunch of barbarians running through the forests of Russia, but we are a modern European country. Well, new capitals are being built all the time, and they all have a message. Abuja on the left, the brand new ultra-modern capital of Nigeria, surging into the future. And its location is important, because if you look at the map in the middle, you see the northern half of Nigeria is Muslim. The southern half is Christian. Well, right in the middle of the country, right on the border, is Abuja. So it's going to be future-looking, not looking back to its past, not looking to religion, either Muslim or Christian, but a brand new city where everyone could be welcome. Brazil, on the right, you see the capital, Brasilia. Move away from Rio on the Atlantic Ocean and move into the interior. Brand new future. And below that, Kazakhstan, the new capital of Kazakhstan, Astana. Ultra modern, looking into the future where it's Russian population in the north and it's Muslim population in the south could work together to create a brand new civilization. Well, that's how Washington took place with a message. It was going to be modern. It was going to be not Northern, not Southern, not slave, not free, not Christian, not Muslim. It was going to look back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. So the architecture of Washington, D.C. has nothing to do with Christianity, it has nothing to do with Judaism. It only looks back to the wisdom of the Greeks, the Republic of the Romans. Well, it was on the Potomac River, which was basically in the geographic center of the coast, although it was in Maryland, which was a slaveholding state. Originally, though, across the river, there was another chunk in this square, and that was to be taken from Virginia. But Washington said, we don't need such a big space. And so they gave Arlington back to Virginia, probably one of the most stupid real estate decisions in human history. So it was in the middle of the states. It looked back to Greek Republic of Plato, to the Roman Republic, to the Senate of Rome, the gathering of representatives in a Congress. So the message of Washington, D.C. was we are a new country. We reject 
thousands of years of kings and monarchs and wars of religion. And we look back to the Republic of Greece, of Athens, and of ancient Rome. Well, Thomas Cole, who started painting his vision of the future of the United States, uh, portrayed the new country being born as a new Garden of Eden. Well, the time when the United States became independent was rather a confusing time. Edward Gibbon had just published his volume, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. In fact, George Washington was reading that book at Valley Forge, the legend goes. But the first volume was published in 1776. Well, we're building a new country. We're building, as George Washington called it, a new empire. Well, Gibbon reminded people, well, you better do a good job of it because Rome declined and fell. Thomas Cole said, Every empire rises, and we see the painting. He called it the ruins of the American empire. Benjamin Franklin said, well, yes, we have a constitutional republic and a president and a congress. We have a government, but can we keep it? Will the new American empire decline and fall like the Romans, like the Greeks, like every other ancient empire, or will it last forever? Well, Washington, D.C. looked back to ancient Rome, the Greek and Roman architecture of the public in Athens and the Roman Republic. And so they decided that the buildings of this new capital were going to be built in Greek and Roman style. To remind people, of the greatness of Rome, and in a way to warn them, be wary, because if we mess things up, the American empire will fall, just like the Roman empire. So the architecture, as we're going to see, of this new capital was Greek and Roman, both plugging into the ancient Greek and Roman empires, but at the same time warning that all the great empires of the past fell. Why did they fall? Not too long ago, we saw the Republicans storming the Capitol building, a monument of Greek and Roman architecture to overthrow the elections and to have Donald Trump proclaimed as a president. How close we came to a revolution and the end of the Constitution. So, Washington City has a major message. Well, the main drag through Washington, D.C. is Pennsylvania Avenue. You can see it cutting diagonally across the map, going from the Capitol building up on the hill, down the street, to the White House, and then continuing out towards Georgetown and into Maryland. So it was laid out to be the Grand Avenue of the new capital. This was not by accident. It was planned. Well, the two big important buildings were the White House and the Capitol. The Capitol was begun already in 1793. And on the left, we say we see the way it looked in 1855. The one wing was growing, the other wing was still small. The dome was a temporary uh, um, wooden structure. Well, the dome started taking shape during the Civil War. 
This is an, uh, a major decision by President Abraham Lincoln. Finish the Capitol building, the symbol of the unity of the 13 colonies and of all the states, the symbol of the American government by the people. So on uh, one hand, he was fighting the Civil War to defeat the South, but with the other hand, he was building the dome to complete the Capitol building. This is what the Capitol building looks like today. Greek columns across the front and a Roman dome on top of it. So this was a symbol, not of the presidency, but of the Congress with the Senate in one side, the House of Representatives on the other. This is the building the revolutionaries of January 6 tried to storm and put on fire. Lynch, the vice president, and put Donald Trump back in the White House. So when the Republicans attacked the Capitol building, they were basically saying, we no longer accept the Constitution. We no longer accept the role of Congress, and many people viewed it as a sign of the end of the American democracy and the rise of a dictatorship. So, once again, buildings have meaning. In the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue was the White House. This was begun in 1792. Uh, one year before, or several months before, the building uh, began on the Capitol building. It, too, had a Greek entranceway. You see the triangle with the four pillars. That's, again, hearkening back to Greece and Rome. Well, it was barely, and not even yet, completed when it was burned during the War of 1812, by the British. The United States had invaded Canada and burned um, the capital of Canada to the ground. And so the British invaded the United States and burned big chunks of Washington. Well, before it was burned, there was one president, John Adams, the second president of the United States, and his famous wife, Abigail, who had moved into the White House, uh, the very first president and first lady to live in the White House. Well, Abigail was probably the most stylish and lavishly spending vice um, first lady that we ever had. She almost drove the country into bankruptcy because she insisted on making the White House as beautiful and as culturally sophisticated as the palaces of kings in Europe and in Asia. So she decorated it lavishly, had grand balls, magnificent champagne dinners, and really made the White House into a rival to the great palaces of the kings and czars of Europe. 1.2 miles separate the White House and the Capitol building. Here we see the facade that we see from Pennsylvania Avenue at the top with the Greek entranceway. The backside has its rounded porch with once again Greek columns. Thomas Jefferson made Pennsylvania Avenue an important avenue because on March 4th of 1805, he was inaugurated at the incomplete Capitol building where presidents until today take the oath of office. And then he mounted his horse and his family in carriages, and they processed down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. 
This was the first Pennsylvania Avenue inaugural procession. Now, Grand Avenues, whether it's the Champs Elysees in Paris, Paseo de la Reforma in Mexico City, Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg, a Grand Avenue is more than a place for traffic. It is a stage where grand events are celebrated. Think of Fifth Avenue, St. Patrick's Day Parade, Gay Pride Parade, all of the different grand parades on Fifth Avenue or on Broadway, Macy's Parade, the ticker tape parades on uh, Broadway. So a Grand Avenue is more than a street. It is a stage. And Thomas Jefferson made it a stage. With, and it wasn't even paved yet. It was filled with mud and horse and dog poop all over the place. But yet he went along the road and had the first inaugural procession. The very first funeral was on April 4th or shortly after that, 1841, when William Henry Harrison died. Well, he had his inaugurational procession on March 4th, 1841. And just a couple uh, weeks later, 31 days later, his funeral procession was on the same avenue. Well, Major processions, such as the inaugural by 1841, were marked by the roar of cannons, church bells ringing, crepe decorations hung from windows, flags were all over the place, uh, and the streets were filled with people. First time cheering as he went from the Capitol to the White House, and then his funeral going the other direction to the Capitol building where he would lay in state. So funerals became a major feature of Pennsylvania Avenue. This is what Pennsylvania Avenue looked like in 1852 before the American Civil War. And you can see it's on a, a rise, a hill overlooking the city. The dome is still the temporary wooden dome. And this is the main entrance where people go in and out. The front is a monumental stairway, but when you visit it, you go in from the top of the hill. And you see going down the, bra the Grand Avenue, very broad. And at the end, you see the, faintly the White House. Now, in front of the Capitol building is what we call the mall. M-A-L-L. -L. And there you can see it still had its canal. And you see the Smithsonian um, Museum in the middle, the Reddish Building. And then in the distance, you see the Washington Monument, the obelisk. So the um, Pennsylvania Avenue was already a major uh, institution during the Civil War. Well, it was a street. It wasn't just a stage. And there weren't funerals and inaugurations taking place every day. So people built houses along it. It was the main drag. Well, on either side, people bought lots. They built houses. And it was a real city. And the area along Pennsylvania Avenue became famous, not just for funerals and weddings and inaugurations, but it had 50 saloons where you could drink and dance and have food. 64 more drinking houses, which we call bars. And a whopping 108 houses of prostitution. Now, don't forget, Washington was a new city. Most wives of senators and congressmen didn't even want to live in this hot humid, mosquito-infested, swampy area. So all of these congressmen and government employees would go to Washington. They would rent a small place, like many of them still do today. And the wife and kids would stay back in 
the state wherever they came from. So all these congressmen and senators and government employees had to have some fun. And since they were in a city of predominantly men, well, prostitution was a great way for people to enjoy themselves. In fact, during the Civil War, so many prostitutes were working in Washington, and very often the government even supported them. Because if you have a bunch of frustrated soldiers, uh, uh, they're going to get into fights and they're going to drink and get drunk and play cards. Uh, so they may as well go out and have a good time with a prostitute and then go home and fall asleep and be in good shape to march off to war the next day. Well, General Joseph Hooker, according to the story, hired the prostitutes. He put them up in tents among his soldiers and his soldiers could go over and have a little bit of fun. Well, it was General Hooker, which is where we get the word Hooker today, named after wonderful Joseph Hooker of the Army of the Potomac. They often called these prostitutes Hooker's Brigade or General Hooker's Army, his other army. So Washington, at the, or during the time of the Civil War, was a rather wild place. Well, it was not just General Hooker who um, catered to the prostitutes, but here in New York, the soldiers from all over New England would come to New York. They would do their military training, get prepared to march off to war. And so there was wonderful Madame Restel, who provided prostitutes for all of these frustrated uh, soldiers. In fact, she became one of the wealthiest women in New York, New York's first self-made millionaire, by providing thousands of prostitutes for the soldiers of Abraham Lincoln. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln ever wrote her a letter to thank her for supporting the war cause, but uh, wouldn't surprise me uh, if he didn't. Well, during the Civil War, whenever a new unit of soldiers uh, could tear themselves away from the bars and the prostitutes, get in their uniform, and get into formation, during the war, there were constant parades of soldiers up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. The one on the left, you see a bunch of soldiers marching down. In the distance, you see the Capitol building. By 1865, the dome was already taking shape. Very often, the president would go out and sit in a or stand in a reviewing stand and watch the soldiers march by. Very for many of them, that would be the last parade they would ever experience because they were marching off to war. Well, of course, Lincoln's funeral was a major occasion on um um Pennsylvania Avenue, April 19, 1865. The procession started from the White House at 2 p.m. and proceeded up the avenue to the Capitol. Bells were ringing. Soldiers were firing guns into the air. The funeral car was carried up the steps of the Capitol beneath the very spot where six weeks before the president had delivered his second inaugural and into the rotunda, excuse my phone ringing, okay? And into the rotunda where the uh, funeral service was read. Here again, this was widely reported in the press and it was a major um, event um, in the history of the avenue.
So Pennsylvania Avenue is living up to its reputation as not just a street, but an avenue, a grand stage for grand events. Well, Abraham Lincoln was not too happy that Pennsylvania Avenue had become a center of bars and prostitutes and dogs and people kept cows and pigs and chickens in their backyard back in those days. And so he hired a man named Mr. Downing to clean up the area. And so Downing started um, demolishing a lot of the older rundown wooden houses and expelling the prostitutes to at least a couple blocks away from uh, the avenue and to make Pennsylvania Avenue into a grand avenue that would be a pride for the country. Well, his plan was inspired by the grand avenues of Europe once again. On the left, you see the Mall, which is the Grand Avenue of London, going from Buckingham Palace with statues paved red, the only street in England which is allowed to be paved in royal red, and going down to the Admiralty Arches in the middle of uh, London. There's a picture of me standing in front of Buckingham Palace a while back when I was there. Well, actually, I was there, and then shortly when I came back to New York, Queen Elizabeth II died, and her funeral procession went down the mall. We call it a mall in Britain. It's called a mall. And then shortly after that, Charles was crowned, and Queen Camilla was crowned, and then they went down, up and down the mall to their celebrate their coronation. So within a period of a short while after I left, there was both a funeral and a coronation. Well, Downing, in addition to building and restoring Pennsylvania Avenue, he also laid out what we call the mall in Washington, D.C., Whereas the mall in Washington, D.C. is not a street, but it is a giant park with the obelisk. Um, you see the Lincoln Memorial at the bottom. And up at the top in the right-hand corner is the Capitol building. So that became um, the answer to the English mall. But Pennsylvania Avenue remained the grand avenue for grand events. Well, gradually, as the older buildings, which you see on the right, and the houses of prostitution and the bars and the rooming houses were torn down, and as Pennsylvania Avenue was, was paved, gradually, some important buildings were being built. One of the very first was the Treasury Building. Here again, we see the Greek influence in 1836. This was one of the more uh, magnificent buildings um, and one of the very first truly monumental buildings uh, to be built along it. Uh, this is the organization which controls all of our money. Other buildings were being built. Well, of course, if you're going to be have a main avenue, you're going to have to have beautiful buildings. Well, the, the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian Art Museum was built at one at 1661 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the building on the left uh, in 1858. And here again, it was rather um, Victorian architecture. Um, and it was not very welcomed 
even the Smithsonian Museum, which you see in the middle at the bottom, which is on the Mall of 1847, was not Greek and Roman architecture. Everybody agreed that Washington should have Greek and Roman architecture. No Victorian buildings, no Gothic buildings, such as St. Patrick's Cathedral. Washington was going to be linked not to the Christian Bible, not to the Jewish Bible or the Koran or the Buddhist Bible, but it's going to be linked to ancient Greece and Rome. Well, it was Ulysses S. Grant who in 1876 uh, made major improvements. It was permanently paved with asphalt. Asphalt came from South American island of Trinidad. It was a type of petroleum that when it was exposed, uh, it would harden. And so Pennsylvania Avenue became paved. It was starting to get beautiful buildings. And it was extended deep into Maryland, one long continuous avenue. In fact, they claim that Pennsylvania Avenue was 35 miles long. Now, it is claimed that Broadway in New York goes a whole length of Manhattan, jumps over the Harlem River and then up through the Bronx. Some people even claim that Broadway goes the whole way to Albany, which would probably make up much longer than Pennsylvania Avenue. But for most people, Broadway is in Manhattan and Pennsylvania Avenue is basically the famous stretch from the Capitol to the White House. Another famous building is the old post office, uh, Victorian uh, um, architecture or Ro um, Romanesque architecture. But inside it has a magnificent open courtyard, which you can see in the picture on the left. This was built in the late 1890s, and that was the building that Donald Trump managed as his uh, um, Trump Hotel, which was very controversial. He'd overcharge all these foreign diplomats and made a fortune off of that um, hotel. But it is no, no longer a Trump hotel. He had to get rid of it, and it's now being turned into offices or something. The great Macmillan plan of 1901 laid out a monumental center for Washington. It's in the form of a cross. You see the Capitol building on the right, going down to the Lincoln Memorial, with the Mao going through. And then from the front door of the White House, going down to the Potomac River, made the other wing. And they were all connected by a diamond type shaped um, collection of streets. But yet Pennsylvania Avenue remained four times as wide as every other Avenue. And this was to really transform Washington into a major world cap, world quality capital. The district building, which govern, governs the um, District of Columbia, it's not a state, was built in 1908. Many people in Washington have demanded that the District of Columbia become a state, but this would have to be approved by Congress. And so home rule for the District of Columbia probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. 1924, the monumental Warner Theater with its glorious interior um, was opened showed shows as well as movies, vaudeville. A big protest was held in 1894 when Cox's army of the unemployed marched. During the economic panic, 
of 1893. So in addition to buildings, Pennsylvania Avenue became a center for protests. The great 1894 protest. Next came the great Ku Klux Klan march of 1925. Thousands of white road Ku Klux Klan members marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, Capitol Building to the White House to reinforce racism, segregation of the United States. Well, gradually, during the 1960s uh, and before, Washington, D.C. started declining. The well-to-do white people moved out of the city, and huge numbers of blacks from the South moved in, and once again, Washington started uh, becoming a rather... Uh, underdeveloped city. A lot of the residential areas, the houses were chopped up into little apartments, and crime and drugs, um, gang warfare started really um, um, making Washington into a less and less uh, welcoming place. Well, in the 1960s, there was another initiative, such as that of during the Civil War, to make Washington, D.C. beautiful again. Uh, the National Capital Planning Commission, Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative, uh, was basically aimed to make Pennsylvania Avenue, the mall, and the rest of downtown Washington a pleasant place to live. Another great event in the night in 1963 was, of course, JFK's funeral. Um, uh, and this featured the first riderless black horse, which um, had been used for George Washington's funeral procession uh, in 1799. And that has become a feature of the presidential funerals. Well, Pennsylvania Avenue was losing more and more of its smaller buildings and being replaced by the ones we see in the picture on the left, these big, very anonymous glass buildings with not much color. There were a few attempts to um, restore the Greek and Roman influence on Pennsylvania Avenue, such as we have the Department of Justice uh, building, which was open in 1935. And here again, we see a Greek temple super glued to the exterior of a rather nondescript um, office building. The FBI building of 1975 scandalized a lot of people because it had no even hint of the Greek and Roman origins of Washington, D.C. But unfortunately, more and more of Washington, D.C. is being filled with these rather um, uninteresting cement and glass buildings. The Ronald Reagan Building for International Trade at least attempted to have some little, some pillars on the corner uh, and a nice rotunda inside, once again trying to recapture the glories of ancient Greek and Roman republics. Well, the avenue is not just a stage for grand national events and protests uh, and a grand avenue in the middle of a capital city, but it has really captured the imagination of a lot of writers and artists. 
novels such as that by J.A. Rich, Pennsylvania Avenue, Nightmare Along Pennsylvania Avenue, A Pestilence on Pennsylvania Avenue. Here again, crime, politics, scandals, Monica Lewinsky, assassinations, in Washington, always focus on Pennsylvania Avenue. In fact, a pestilence on Pennsylvania Avenue um, is, has a subtitle, uh, The Impact of Disease Upon the American Presidency. Uh, presidents getting sick, presidents uh, like Donald, uh, like uh, Joseph Biden, uh, almost falling down or tripping over somebody where questions of health are very much in the news. Political intrigue, Pennsylvania Avenue profiles in backroom power. Insurrection, the attempted coup d'etat to take over the government of July 6. America's main street, the future of Pennsylvania Avenue, what kind of street is it going to be? Another wonderful book, Pennsylvania Avenue, celebrating the glories of political power. Murder at 1600 in Washington, D.C. And reflected in his glasses, you can see Wesley Snipes' glasses, the right lens, you see the White House. Some, uh, other movies are very often showing views of Pennsylvania Avenue, such as Wonder Woman there. I don't remember what she was doing in Washington, and I never watched any of the Wonder Woman movies, but evidently she had something to do with Washington the Angel of Pennsylvania Avenue, Central Casting, Pennsylvania Avenue, Film Industry in Washington, D.C. Women's March, again, very important part of protests, gay marches, women's marches, minority marches, Muslim marches, um, protesting racism and discrimination in the United States. So we have just visited one of the great capital cities of the world. This one was Pennsylvania Avenues. So if you'd like to contact me, it's Ron Brown Media at gmail.com. I always love to get feedback from people who watch um, my videos, and I look forward to hearing from you, and I'll probably be seeing you again sometime with another exciting video by Dr. Ronald Brown. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.